Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Washburn, and I am delighted to welcome you to the 2019 graduation, graduation ceremony for the Iowa College of Law. In this commencement exercise, we will graduate students earning the Juris Doctor, the Master in the Studies of Law, the LLM, and an SJD degrees. For today's program, I am joined on the platform by today's commencement speaker, the Honorable Joel H. Folger, Chief Justice of Alaska, Iowa Class of 1978, and our president, Bruce Harold, who has the most important assignment of the day, conferring degrees upon all these deserving students, and of course, by the extraordinary faculty of the Iowa College of Law. On behalf of the College of Law, I extend a special welcome and hearty congratulations to our most honored guests. The spouses and partners, the parents and grandparents, children, children, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, and all the other family and friends of today's graduates. Thank you for supporting our students through the terror of the first year of law school, the hard work of the second year of law school, and the impatience of the third year of law school. Thank you for comforting and encouraging, encouraging them when things didn't go exactly the way they hoped, and for cheering with us on their truly extraordinary achievements from matriculation to graduation. I know that without your unwavering support, they would not be here today. Well done. Graduates, we can't thank them enough, so please join me now in thanking your family and friends. Distinguished members of the class of 2019, what a privilege it is to address you today. As I look back on the many years since I sat where you do today, I have a twinge of envy. You are beginning one of life's great adventures. It will not always be easy. Your job will be to help others as they confront some of life's most difficult challenges. Life as a lawyer can be fulfilling. It can also be frustrating. It can be joyous, and it can be occasionally gut-wrenching. You will soon be taking on great responsibility because people will look to you for solutions to difficult problems. You will be involved in many important decisions, but they will often be made by others, whom we call clients. They will make the decisions, but you will feel responsible all the same. Even with a law degree, you won't be able to solve all problems. You won't be able to stop the floods that are currently inundating eastern and western Iowa, for example. But you can provide crucial help with the aftermath, as our alum, Joel Greer, mayor of Marshalltown, found last summer, last summer after his city was tragically rearranged by a powerful tornado. You are the 154th graduating class of Iowa law. When you arrived, Dean Gail Agrawal tells me that she asked you to embrace the college's culture of collaboration and civility as you engaged in the study of law. Look to your right, left and look to your right. Most of your classmates are still here. That is in part because you supported one another. I thank you for that because you have helped keep the law school community collegial. It's a beacon of civility and an oasis of calm in a loud and complicated world. Not to say that you have not engaged in disagreement occasionally. Learning together and with the guidance of your long-suffering faculty members, your class has taken the art of legal argument to an Olympic sport. You succeeded in moot court and trial advocacy competitions. You succeeded on law reviews and journals. You learned to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Professor Kurtz and Professor Pettis and Dean Hughes and Dean Jones. If by chance there are some family members or friends in the audience who suffered collateral damage while a member of this class was learning to think and argue like a lawyer, on behalf of the faculty, we want to extend a sincere apology to all of you. While it is never easy, and truth be told, generally quite unpleasant to be among the highly select group on whom a law student practices her developing lawyerly skills, I hope today you can forget the pain of those moments and rejoice in today's achievement because you sacrificed to help make it happen. Thank you, family members. Thomas Jefferson advised law students to read from dawn until bedtime. I know that a lot of you took a healthier approach to law school and life, and some of you even occasionally had fun during law school. Come Monday morning, though, I urge you to focus on reading from dawn until bedtime for the next couple of months, just until you get through the bar examination. We warned you at the beginning of this law school journey that law does not have prodigies, and that becoming lawyers requires work. Not all the work is done, and not, not only talking about the bar exam, 
You have been challenged by a rigorous legal education, and you have greatly exceeded the achievements of the reasonable person, but there is still much learning to do as you work to become wise counselors and learned lawyers. I hope you will indulge me with a few pieces of advice as you leave us. In the words of Thomas, Thomas Jefferson, I urge you to lay down true principles and to adhere to them inflexibly. Just as no commencement speaker ever erred by speaking too little, no lawyer ever went astray from exercising too much integrity. Second, embrace the lawyer's highest calling to pursue justice. Follow the advice of civil rights activist, Congressman John Lewis. When you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, Find the courage to stand up, to speak up, and find a, find a way to get in the way. And finally, continue to serve the public as well as you have during your time here. Members of the class of 2019 contributed more than 6,000 hours of pro bono and community service during your time here at the law school. By my count, 28 of you exceeded 100 hours of community service. Thank you for this public service. As the law building's namesake, President Emeritus Sandy Boyd often reminds us, people, not buildings, make great institutions. And the people in this class have done more than your part to advance an Iowa law tradition of greatness. We thank you for that. You've given us the intellect of Nathan Golden, the moral compass of Human Rights Award winner Carrington Buzz, the commitment to service of top Boyd Service Award winner Lenita Michelle Lewis Clark, and perhaps most significant of all, None of you landed us on the website above the law during your time here. <laughs> For that, I will always be grateful. I wish I could say that you shared even a small fraction of the nostalgia that the faculty and I feel today, but we uh, suspect that you are much more enthusiastic about leaving us than we are about seeing you go. We will miss you. Each of you worked very hard to get to this point, but I want you to know that the faculty and I will take immense delight in all of your accomplishments going forward. We will beam with pride when we see you pass the bar, when we see you win your first case, or close your first big deal, or help someone win custody of a child, or achieve citizenship, or even when you become a judge, a senator, or perhaps even president. Now we will also take full credit for your success. As professors, we remain behind in the ivory tower, and aside from our scholarship, you're largely the way we make a difference in the world, and that's what motivates us to keep teaching. Please stay in touch with us as your career unfolds so that each of us can brag to our colleagues in the faculty lounge about your success and our part in it. Thank you. The, the le The late Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said, the law is the calling of thinkers, and each of you is now called to the law. You came to us from river to river in Iowa, across the United States, and around the world. You joined us with experience in the US Air Force, Army, Navy, Marines, National Guard, as doctors, social workers, and entrepreneurs, as farmers, managers, and teachers, and even as mothers and fathers. In your spare time, you grilled, you gardened, you enjoyed our thunderstorms, participated in soccer, basketball, volleyball, yoga. You volunteered in soup kitchens, homeless shelters, and on political campaigns. You leave us prepared for new professional opportunities and your life's next adventure in Los Angeles and New York, the Twin Cities, Chicago, Omaha, Washington, DC, across Iowa in Des Moines, Dubuque, Cedar Rapids, Council Bluffs, Spencer, Winterset, and Sioux City, and wherever in the world the United States Navy decides to send Jared Manternak. Your immediate work will span big law to legal aid and judicial clerkships to Main Street law firms. Among you are immigrants and first-generation Americans, as well as second and third-generation Hawkeyes. To all the Iowa lawyers, parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles who entrusted your children to us so they might follow in your footsteps in the law, you have paid us a high compliment and we thank you. Others of you are like me, the first in your family to graduate from law school or perhaps even from college. I know firsthand that your time here has been life changing and I congratulate you on the groundbreaking steps you have taken today as you walk across this stage to receive your degree. 
As you walk across the stage, know that you are not alone. You are part of a very rich tradition. Indeed, this beautiful building, just like Slater Hall and Kinnick Stadium, is named after a former Iowa law student. This one is named after Virgil Hancher, law class of 1924. Perhaps there will be buildings named after you someday. You earned it. You are an extraordinary group. Along with the faculty, I feel very privileged to have spent a short time, amount of time with you at the beginning of the long arc of your careers. Congratulations. And now it's time for me to relinquish the podium to one of your own. I invite Alexander Parrott, elected speaker of the class of 2019, to the podium to address us all. Well, this is incredible. How's it going, everybody? <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Thank you, faculty. Thank you, class of 2019, for this opportunity. Thank you, Mom, Dad, Grandma, Amanda. You were all my rock through this experience, and I owe so much of this to you. Now, before I really get going here, there is one final person I need to thank. I need to thank my mentor-in-law. For the sake of brevity and anonymity, let's just call him Mr. C. Now, Mr. C is an old Italian trial lawyer from my hometown. I've known him most of my life, and I worked for him as a legal intern the summer before my 1L year. Mr. C was a good guy to work for, because he is your gold standard attorney. He checks all the boxes. He has the brain of Atticus Finch with the charisma of, let's say, my cousin Vinny. His office is filled wall to wall with dusty legal books, and he wears a dark gray suit every single day, almost as if it's surgically attached to his body. But most importantly, Mr. C has that one trait that all great lawyers must have. He has the trait of proving his points by using these rhetorical little phrases that sound great, but you're never actually sure if they mean anything. See, he loved to use these phrases when he was imparting wisdom on me. He would say things like, Alex, I sold women's shoes at Yonkers before I was a lawyer. If you could sell a shoe, you can be a lawyer. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. C. He also liked to say, there are two kinds of people in the world. You got your alley cats and you got your parlor cats. What kind of cat are you? <laughs> I never knew what kind of cat I was because <laughs> I had no idea what in the world he was talking about. But he also had one other phrase he loved to say. See, he always liked to talk to me about law school. And almost daily, he would say to me, Alex, law school will change you. Now that phrase always stuck with me. Law school will change you. I initially wrote this off. I thought this was just more fortune cookie wisdom from Mr. C. After all, I'd been in school for 16 years at that point. How much damage could three more years do? I was also fresh out of college at the time, and I had some rebellious spirit in me. I thought, bring it on, law school. Give me your best shot. But truthfully, I didn't fully understand what Mr. C meant until I was writing this speech, reflecting on my three years here. See, Mr. C didn't mean law school was going to kill my spirit and turn me into a legal robot. Mr. C meant law school was a crucible. Now, a little history lesson for you. The idea of crucible stems from medieval alchemy. A crucible was a clay pot that could withstand immense temperatures. Alchemists, ambitious as they are, thought they could make gold by putting a bunch of metals into the crucible and blasting it with heat. I don't think they were very successful. But the modern day usage of the word reflects this concept. And there's a few definitions that are important for us here. First, a crucible can be defined as a time of great stress and adversity. There's a sociological theory that all great leaders, all successful people, are formed through crucibles. I'll give you some examples. Franklin Roosevelt, 
lost a bitter campaign for vice presidency, then contracted polio the very same year. He would go on to become governor of New York and then lead this country through the Great Depression and much of World War II. Oprah Winfrey was born into poverty and became pregnant at the age of 14. Then she became, well, Oprah. Bill Gates failed his first startup and dropped out of college before he founded Microsoft. Heck, even Forrest Gump was born with a curved spine, but he taught Elvis how to dance and became a world champion ping pong player. <laughs> the point is, crucibles are times that test you and make you question your values. The traits it takes to survive times of adversity are the same traits that make people great leaders and successful individuals. Now I'm gonna tell you all something that might surprise you. We haven't been sitting around watching Judge Judy for the past three years. Law school wasn't full of sunshine and rainbows. It was work. It was tough, grinding work. In the first year, your days are consumed doing three things. Reading, going to class, and praying to Jesus you don't get cold called. <laughs> By the second year, readings go a little bit faster, cold calls get a little bit easier, and you start to walk around the school with a little bit of confidence. But then Journal and App Ad and all the student organizations you joined crash on top of you like a grand piano dropped from a building. All the while, you have to juggle the job search, sending out resumes and traveling to interviews. And I haven't even mentioned finals yet. Finals were war zones. They involved furiously reading and typing and pounding coffee for four hours, worried that if you use the bathroom, you wouldn't have time to answer that last hypothetical. Folks, I can keep going on all day, but this is a long ceremony, so I'm just giving you the greatest hits here. What you need to know is that if you were like me and you had some rebellious spirit left over from college, law school would effectively beat that starch right out of you. Law school was undoubtedly a time of great stress and adversity. I know what you're all thinking. This is a terrible motivational speech. <laughs> but stick with me, this gets better, I promise. Because lucky for us, a crucible has a second definition. A crucible can also be defined as a situation in which different elements interact, leading to the creation of something new. I know I just described law school as a nightmarish hellscape, but I survived this experience alongside the 130 classmates sitting in front of you. I survived it because of my classmates. I attended law school with a very special group of people. Even though it was located in a small town in eastern Iowa, the law school was incredibly diverse. There were political aides and Supreme Court clerks, college football, basketball, baseball, and soccer players, airplane pilots, journalists, photographers, musicians, singers, actors, doctors, veterans. We had people from different religions and different races and different countries. These people showed me different worldviews, different perspectives on approaching work and family and life. I don't have time to tell you everything my classmates meant to me over the last three years. I'll simply tell you this, we learned how to be lawyers together. And that means a few things. First, we learned to love the law together. We love to talk about our classes, talk about our readings, or make stupid jokes about contracts. We learned to add levity to this experience that could so easily become dour. Secondly, we learned to love the grind together. Okay, love might be a strong word there. But reading and writing became second nature to us because we pushed each other every single day. That old cliche that iron sharpens iron is so true in law school. I watched my classmates work their tails off. Some of them, and they know who they are, would get to school before it even unlocked for the day. They literally couldn't wait to go to work. And when they went to work, they worked with a passion, almost as if they really, really wanted to be lawyers. And their passion inspired me. It forced me to push my own limits beyond what I thought was possible. I honestly don't know if I would have made it through this experience without my classmates, without them working alongside me, supporting me, and teaching me. I revere my classmates. I cherished the law school experience because of them. So ultimately, law school really is nothing but a crucible. Law school was the clay pot, and inside the pot, were the different elements, my classmates and I. The readings and the writings and the cold calls and the finals and the jobs exerted great stress on the pot. But inside, the elements interacted with each other, supported each other, 
and strengthened each other, and the elements withstood the pressure. We survived the crucible, and we came out changed people. Now, I don't know if any of my classmates can sell a woman's shoe worth a damn, but I like to think we all have a little bit of alley cat in us now. Yes, Mr. C, I figured out what it means. When my classmates go out into the real world, they aren't going to sit around and wait for a saucer of milk to be handed to them. They're going to fight and scrap for their meals. They're going to face adversity head on and put in the work to be a good lawyer. That was the key lesson from Mr. C. And quite frankly, that was the key lesson from this whole law school experience. After beating the crucible of law school, I believe these people have what it takes to be successful. I believe they have what it takes to be great leaders in their communities. I believe they have what it takes to be incredible lawyers. Thank you so much for everything you've given me over the past several years, class of 2019. I don't know what you're all doing after law school, but wherever you're doing, wherever you're going, go give them hell. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. I am now honored to introduce the Honorable Joel Bolger, our 2019 commencement speaker. Raised in Coon, Coon Rapids, Iowa, Bolger is a 1976 graduate of the University of Iowa and a 1978 graduate of this law school. He is a formal, former legal aid lawyer, public defender, and lawyer in private practice, and then he rose through every level of the Alaska court system to reach the Supreme Court of Alaska. He is now the Chief Justice of Alaska, which means, I think, that he necessarily exercises authority over more geography than any general jurisdiction appellate judge in the entire United States. Please join me in welcoming the Chief Justice to the podium. Thank you, Dean Washburn. I'm grateful to be here with you and with these graduates and their families and friends, their teachers and colleagues, to celebrate this wonderful occasion. The first time I came to this campus, I was a high school senior at the end of a losing football season at Coon Rapids High School. To cheer me up, my football coach brought me across the state to a Hawkeye football game at Kinnick Stadium. Before the game, we stopped to visit my coach's high school teammate, a law professor named Mark Schantz. I was impressed because my coach told me that the professor had once scored 50 points in a high school basketball game. But what I now remember about this meeting was that uh, Professor Schantz was sincere and encouraging to me as he talked about law school and the practice of law. I'm sure many of these students have received similar encouragement from the great faculty and staff here at the University of Iowa College of Law. So 47 years later, I'm very proud to be here today. There's plenty of articles on the internet about giving commencement speeches, but they all seem to require the speaker to have a message, that is to give the audience and the graduates some words of advice. So my advice will be three simple ideas. Be grateful, be patient, and be brave. First of all, be grateful. We will start with the audience here today. Now I'm talking about uh, President Harold, Dean Washburn, the faculty and administration of the University of Iowa and the College of Law, and the parents, the spouses, partners, friends, and colleagues of the graduates who sit here today. You have supported these students through a long and sometimes difficult education. You may have directly paid the tuition and expenses to make this big step possible. Many of you have been involved in this process from the time these students were in preschool right up through their valuable law school education. And many of you have provided critical emotional support at difficult times. 
Now, the dean and I didn't compare notes before these speeches, but we obviously had the same idea. I want to make sure that these graduates do not fall asleep on this opportunity. So again, I'm gonna ask the graduates to join me in a round of applause to the people who brought you here today. Why are we so grateful? because it is a truly great thing to be part of the justice system in this country. For one thing, lawyers are essential to the system of promises that underlies our free market economy. Lawyers negotiate and write the agreements that make economic development possible. Lawyers thus help us to avoid business disputes and help promote reasonable resolutions when disputes arise. For another thing, lawyers provide the professional services that allow us to maintain a democracy based on majority rule. Lawyers in the legislative branch help write and enact the statutes that establish our basic public policies. Lawyers in the executive branch help adopt the regulations and policies necessary to administer those laws. When disputes arise, Lawyers and judges in the judicial branch help ensure that disputes in this country are decided by the rule of law rather than financial influence or short-term political whims. In a changing society, lawyers help us maintain a fair allocation of the effect of tragedies in our daily lives. When a married couple needs a divorce, the property must be divided fairly taking into consideration their income, their children, their future prospects, and their health. When an accident happens, lawyers and judges help ensure that the economic impact needs to fall on those who caused the accident or those best positioned to avoid the loss. Finally, lawyers help to protect the rights and privacies our Constitution guarantees, our freedom of speech, our freedom of religion, our right to bear arms, our freedom against unreasonable searches and seizures, our right to fair procedures in criminal and civil cases, and our protection against excessive punishments. So, today we are grateful to the parents, the partners, and the professors, because you have produced another generation of lawyers to promote these fundamental aspects of our beloved country. Now to my second piece of advice, be patient. You will see many changes over the course of your career. So I want to talk a little bit about how I have seen the practice change over the years. When I was growing up, my parents would get legal advice by driving to the county seat for an appointment in the lawyer's office. If there was a court dispute, the parties would resolve it in the local county courthouse. Many people still interact with lawyers and the justice system in those ways. But technology now allows other alternatives that may prove to be more effective. The Alaska court system is now in a strategic partnership with Microsoft Corporation and Legal Services Corporation to develop a smartphone application that will allow users to access legal services, court forms and processes, and associated resources with a plain language search engine. We are hoping this application will make the court system and other legal resources more available to the residents of our remote villages, where it is quite expensive to travel to visit a lawyer or a courthouse. Similarly, Many court systems across the country and abroad have developed systems for online dispute resolution. Instead of visiting the county courthouse, the parties can negotiate, mediate, and resolve their disputes from their home computers or their smartphones using the same query-based approach you may encounter at the customer service link for a big online retailer. This approach online dispute resolution is now being used for traffic tickets, commercial collections, and even child custody disputes. 
I want to recognize another development that is not so strictly tied to technology. This involves cases that form a big portion of state court caseloads. Cases involving divorce, child custody disputes, child support, and related property settlements. I'm not sure exactly what the statistics are in Iowa, but across the country, most of these cases involve parties who are not represented by counsel. Many of these cases can be resolved quite easily, but our traditional system provides a complicated pathway for unrepresented litigants, a formal discovery process, motion practice, and an adversary trial using technical rules of evidence. To address this discrepancy, the Conference of Chief Justices recently adopted new principles as part of a family justice initiative. This initiative is chaired by Iowa Chief Justice Mark Cady, who is also the president-elect of our national organization. These new principles prescribe a collaborative, problem-solving approach, empowering families rather than fostering resentments. The courts will be responsive to victims of domestic violence and other trauma, but all the cases will be subject to screening to provide early resolution of cases where there are no substantial disagreements and mediation of minor disputes. And even for a case where a judge's involvement is necessary, the initiative recommends informal trial and other simplified processes that are more navigable for an unrepresented litigant. This initiative is not just a prescription. It's also a reflection of practices that are cropping up across the country. And these practices will require a different approach to the practice of law. Some cases will still require a family lawyer to charge a retainer and ongoing fees sufficient for temporary custody disputes, motion practice, and a formal trial. But many cases may benefit from unbundled services. For example, a client may need help to file the initial court forms or to prepare for a mediation session or an informal trial. A family lawyer might find it profitable to begin to offer mediation services to help both parties resolve these disputes. My point is that a lawyer who wants to maintain an ongoing practice in this area may need to be more flexible to adapt to these new, less formal areas for service. The Family Justice Initiative and the other changes I mention are only a few examples of the ways that the justice system and the practice of law are changing to meet new circumstances. So my advice is that you will need to be patient in the face of these changes and nimble to respond. By now, you may have forgotten my third piece of advice. <laughs> it was to be brave. Now I'm talking to the graduating student, students here in the audience with me. When I was trying to come up with a title for this address, I told my law clerks that I wanted to share a bit of my personal story. So that I, they suggested that I should focus on this message uh, with a speech like, if I can do this, then anybody can do it. I, I think they were joking, uh, but that is exactly the message I want you to think about now. I was not a leading student in law school. My finances were pretty sketchy. I had to work part time. I mainly wanted to earn enough credits to finish school as quickly as possible. So I did not have a high grade point average or law review credentials to earn a position as a judge's law clerk or even as a law firm associate. My best shot was a volunteer position, doing legal aid and public defender work with Alaska Legal Services Corporation. They offered me a $500 per month stipend, a warm parka, and an insulated sleeping bag. I had planned to come back to Iowa after a year, but I began to make new friends and colleagues and I decided to stay in Alaska. I worked in public interest positions for about four years 
then opened a law practice with a partner I met in legal aid. I had many adventures those first years. I learned to ski and got caught in an avalanche. I had close encounters with bear and moose and I learned to fish for salmon, halibut, and trout. My partner became deeply involved in the Exxon Valdez oil spill litigation, and that responsibility defined our practice for several years. When the litigation began to wind down, I applied for a judicial position in the small town of Valdez, Alaska. That was 22 years ago. With the support of my family, I climbed a ladder of appointments to my present position on the Alaska Supreme Court. Now I know that some commencement speakers will tell you to follow your dreams, but I never dreamed of being a Chief Justice. Indeed, when I graduated from law school, I did not have any desire to become a judge. Judges just seemed like part of the establishment that I was trying to avoid. At that time, I was much more interested in helping poor people. And I won't try to tell you that my success was due to hard work. I did the work all right, but the most important thing I learned that was that my career would be fine if I simply had the faith to enjoy these opportunities as they came along. Be brave and these opportunities will come along for you. I know there are those of you who have had to borrow a lot of money to get through law school. Some of you may not be sure about the jobs you have taken. Some of you may not even have a job yet. But I have had the experience that I just described, and I have watched many of my colleagues and dozens of my law clerks work through their own career challenges. Those people moved from position to position and job to job until they found a practice that suited their abilities and interests. So have faith and be brave. This is a rewarding profession and there is a place for you. That is the sum of my advice today. Be grateful, be patient, and be brave. You are about to embark on a remarkable career. I greatly appreciate the opportunity you have given me to be part of this wonderful occasion. Thank you and good luck. Thank you, Chief Justice. And now, for the reason we are all here. President Harold, on behalf of the faculty of the College of Law, I am proud to present these candidates who have completed all the requirements for the degrees of Juris Doctor, Master of Law, Masters of Studies in Law, and Doctor of Juridical Science as designated. Members of the class of 2019, please rise and remain standing. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Regents, State of Iowa, I hereby confer on each of you the degree of Juris Doctor, Masters, Master of Law, Master of Studies in Law, and Doctor of Juridical Science as qualified and designated. You may be seated and congratulations. Thank you, President Harold. I will now ask the graduates to come forward to be individually introduced by Professor John Mark Stensvog and to receive their master's or doctoral hoods from Professor Stella Elias and Todd Pettis. We will begin with the students earning the Master in the Studies of Law, followed by the students earning the Juris Doctorate, and concluding with the students earning the LLM and the SJD.
Beirut Abgan. Majid Ibrahim Eseven. Foloshade Amole. Peter Charles Anderson. Tori Lynn Noilani Bakken. Amra Boshich. Stephen Bedwell. Danica Lynn Bird. Lindsay Nicole Blair. Taylor Nicole Bradley. Matt Brown. Anne Marie Beauty. Carrington Buzz. Ariana Dimitra Cronus. Luke James Cole. Amberly Conley. <laughs> Louis Constantino. <laughs> Katie Contario. Abraham Patrick Kopi. Anna Maria Correa. Kyle Joseph Cotelier. Nicole May Coulter Ledbetter. <laughs> Jeffrey Allen Critchlow. <laughs> Maria Rose Critchlow. Sam Crocker. Casey Daly. Elizabeth May Davidson.
Denise DeArma. Noelia Dominguez. Kara Sue Donalds. Iman Ikram. Jake English. Paulina Lissette Escobar. Ryan Foley. Taylor Francis. Jeremy Gallagher. Allison Marie Gertz. Nathan Herbert Golden. Dexter Ralph Gollinghorst. Austin Lane Goodnight. Sarah Catherine Hawk. Haley Ray Hansen Boardman. Hayden Hansen. Holland Leslie Hauenstein. Micah Hawker Benke. Bing Ching Hu. Bryn Elizabeth Headland. Chad Allen Hyman. Emma Catherine Henry. Derek A. Hewish. Nicholas Andrew Jones. Chung Min Kong. Glenn Katz. John Thomas Katuska. Mitchell Cotter. (laughs) 
Ryan King. Benjamin Joseph Kramer. Emily Elizabeth Kramer. Jeremy Coolish. Derek Labrie. Sean Harlow Lancaster. Philip Lapointe. Vanessa May Larson. Rachel Nicole Lee. Brian Christian Leopold. Amanda Lynn Lewandowski. I know. I saw that. Lenita Michelle Lewis Clark. <laughs> Kylie Marie Oberender Liu. Anibal Lopez. Allison Lovell. Rithi D. Medea. Amber Mahoney. Andrea Lorena Mallarino. Jared Montrenac. Benjamin Allen Martin. Olivia Catherine Wilbert Martson. Evan Francis McCarthy. Shane McChurch. Danielle Moeller. Jaime Monte. <laughs> Laura Moon. <laughs> v. Wen. Jacob Todd Anken. Olayanka 
Alake Upwe. Alexander Parrott. Charles D. Paul. Alan Todd Paxton. Ariel Perez. Charlotte Perez. Brandon John Peasley. Emmanuel Franklin Scott Pierce. Haiyan Chu. Christopher Allen Ramsey. Andrea Estefania Rostelli. Lacey Reamer. Ellen Teresa Reynolds. Adam Mitchell Ripp. Dario Alejandro Rodriguez. Kieran Robert Rogers. Amanda Marie Rolon. Ellison Stephanie Teresa Ruin. Emily Alexandria Sample. Noah Leo Schmal. Shane Edward Schmidt. David H. Siegel. Melissa Sharp. Ryan Shelledy. Reed Joseph Shepherd. Brian Evan Schusterman. Jason Smathers. Clayton Solberg. Abraham Sotelo.
Alexandra Marina Stecker. Joseph Forrest Stegmeyer. Samuel Stender. Jacob Andrew Stone. Dakota John Sullivan. Brian James Talcott. Joshua Taylor. Carly Thielen. Elizabeth Alejandrina Urena. Danny Valerio. Alexander Joseph Vargas. Caroline Elizabeth Verbaton. Serena Renee Ward. Austin Weaver. Benjamin William Wedeking. Stephen Welling. Caleb Christian Widmer. Jennifer Louise Wiltsey. Brett John Winborn. Chen Zongjun. <laughs> Liu Jin Yan. <laughs> Tim Pasternak. Waldemar Rodriguez Sanchez. <laughs> Breno Silvestrini Rodriguez. <laughs> Xiao Jung Wang.
Moments ago you were students and now you're alums. Before we close, yep, yes. Let me add just a few words of farewell to the newest alumni of the Iowa College of Law. Our country's 35th president, John F. Kennedy, observed, certain other societies may respect the rule of force. We respect the rule of law. If you all wonder who is responsible for ensuring that this country follows the rule of law, you may look in the mirror. More than anyone else, it is now you. There is a reason that this country has elected more than half of its presidents from the ranks of lawyers. There's a reason that 54 of the United States senators that currently sit in Washington are from our ranks. And there is a reason that for the 44 of the past 50 years, the governor of Iowa has been a lawyer. It was mostly lawyers who founded the United States, and it is a lawyer who led this country out of the Civil War, and it's a lawyer who led this country out of the Great Depression. I remind you that the faculty has prepared you well for this noble calling, and you were prepared for that calling in a public law school. That meets, means that ordinary Iowans, from the farmers in their fields to the cashiers at the local hy V, contributed to the cost of your legal education. After the celebrating is over, I ask you to think seriously about how you will give those hardworking people a return on their investment in you. The need is great, and your options are many. I know that you will choose well. On behalf of your teachers, the staff, and the rising 3L students who long to sit where you are today, I offer our, our affection, our admiration, and our deepest congratulations. This 2019 commencement exercise is now adjourned. Please remain in your seats until the faculty and students have completed the recessional, and then I hope all of you will join us for a reception at the Boyd Law Building. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>